Hi from Pietro, hi from the limited edition. We are in London today and I'm really excited because we have a very special guest, uh, a very inspiring gentleman that we've been following for the last couple of years, uh, uh, shortly after the inception of his, uh, of his brand, Atelier Ven. Today I introduce to you Robin Talandier, who's here with me. And welcome to London, Robin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Pietro. Thank you for, for welcoming me here. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to be with you here today. Thank you. Now, the story of uh, Atelier Van really inspired me, as I said, from the beginning. A young uh, entrepreneur co-founding a, uh, a very inspiring new project in the world of watchmaking based in China, one of those countries that for watchmaking purposes has not had necessarily the highlights uh, over the last uh, few years. So I'm going to ask Robin first, what is the story about? Yeah. When did you envision your project and uh, how far are you in what you want to accomplish? Uh, of course, of course. Actually, that's a story which is very, very long in the making. Uh, I believe it all started basically when I started collecting watches, which was when I was um, 14 years old. So when I was 14 for my birthday, my parents gave me a watch and there was, I still remember, a quartz seco chronograph and it kind of triggered something in me. Uh, it had me like look online for, for more watches and very, very quickly I wanted an automatic watch. So one day I came to my dad, I was like, oh dad, can you buy me a, a Tissot? And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, no, I'm not going to give you 500 euros to, to buy your Tissot. And uh, I didn't get my automatic watch, but still I wanted one very badly. So I, I, I kept on doing research and that's when I first really like encountered Chinese watches. And there was still a time where you could get like a very decent vintage Chinese mechanical watch for, for very little money, for like 100 yuan, which back then was 10 euros. And I was very lucky in the sense that back then with my family, we would go to China quite often. So the following summer, we went to Beijing and I bought my first vintage Chinese watch. And then I bought a second one, a third one, a fourth one, and, and so on. And at the same time, I started talking about them online on watch forums, such as Watch Music, which were a big thing. and. Um, there were a few of us who, who knew about those. So, so quickly, I, I kind of like got in touch with, with the people who, who knew about those. And uh, moving forward, like in my first year of university, I won a scholarship to, to study the summer in, in Beijing. And by chance, actually, I met one of the people with whom I was talking online uh, on Watch Music. And there was like a, a Canadian gentleman, like retired gentleman, who was on holiday there. And it turns out that this person was very well connected in the Chinese watch industry. So he put me in touch with uh, a person named Li Wei, who is like uh, sort of the head of like the, the Chinese chamber of watchmaking. And this person became my, my mentor. Uh, the next year, I went back to Beijing, this time for a full year. And this like Li Wei took me around and made me visit like all the, the key Chinese watchmakers, the movement makers, uh, the big case makers, the dial makers, the artisans, the retailers, like everyone in the sort of like Chinese watchmaking ecosystem. And I mean, obviously I was already really into Chinese watches, but what I, I saw during this year was besides the quality, which I was aware of, was the passion. So, you know, you would meet the, those people, like the, those watchmakers, those dial makers, those artisans, and you talk to them and you'd see how enthusiastic and, and passionate they are about their craft about the, mm -hmm. what they do you know the, the same kind of passion that you you, you often see in like the, the marketing of, of Swiss or old German watches well you, you found the, the same one there and and that really like moved me and and when I went back to Europe I, I started talking about it to, to my friends to, to to the people I knew and, and they wouldn't really believe it they still had this image of like um, yeah being like sweatshops and, and very like uh, unqualified kind of like uh, l labor and I thought well it's it's, it's a bit unfair because uh, this is like a very nice aspect that I really want to, to, to show and celebrate. And that's when I first had the, the idea of, of creating the bread, basically. So from uh, basically from involuntary watch collector of yeah. Chinese uh, brands, then to the step of becoming an ambassador of Chinese S -s 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 Sort of, of. Chinese it's, it's really all serendipity. Like I think I, I never really planned it. It just happened this way. I never said like from the get-go, oh, I'm, I'm gonna make Chinese watches or I'm gonna be into Chinese watches. It was purely always like a consequence of, of something else. But, but yeah, that's, that's how it happened. That's, that's really interesting. What it is about uh, Chinese watchmaking that is at the moment still quite overlooked, what are the stereotypes you had to fight against? And why do you believe you came to a, a point where actually um, Chinese watches can be really inspiring and qu high quality yeah. to some extent. I, I think like broadly speaking, there are two things that are mostly overlooked. Uh, one is about 
the actual, let's say, like intrinsic quality. The second one is about the creativity. Um, Quality-wise, like there's some very qualified craftsmen, some very qualified artisans, a very, very rich tradition of making things by hand in China that goes like back like millionaires in the past. And those things like people don't really today like look at them or pay attention to them. Um, so that's the first one. The second one about creativity, I mean, it, it echoes the same one. I mean, that is often the stereotype that it's going to be copies, it's gonna, going to be fakes, there's not going to be any originality or freshness. But when you look at the, the story of China, you have like such a rich cultural heritage, you have such a rich cultural tradition with its own language, with its own beauty. And this is like something that is like completely, completely overlooked. And this is actually what, what I want to, to celebrate through those watches, to show the craftsmanship, the, the capabilities, the skills, the heritage, um, the, the, the unique like cultural language. The, those are it's, all these beautiful things that I want to show and, and celebrate with other people around the world. Yeah, one of the things, if you go on Atelier Events um, website and on the limited edition, as we become the official retailers in the UK for Atelier Event, you'll find out the level of transparency that actually comes across as very, very, uh, uh, as very, very obvious, I would say. Um, there is a uh, there is a big Pandora box that I don't I don't know if we want to to open here. But you know, even for a Swiss brand to be called Swiss made, we all know that you need sixty yeah. percent of the cost of the watch to be related to Switzerland yeah, yeah. As by, by legal so yeah. uh, requirements. And we all know that in terms of supplying, China has been supplying uh, brands in Europe in Switzerland for yeah. a very very long time. So there is a development of skills that have been happened there have been happening there and also uh, quite importantly during the quartz crisis some of the big makers actually moved yeah. migrated from Switzerland to China so it's not that it's a new thing for them watchmaking is it no no I, I actually like when you look at it I think like modern watchmaking is started in China in 1955 and uh, there was like some heavy heavy investments by the state to make a lot of like manufacturers so already they made like some very big facilities and uh, there was this flow that in each like of the province like capital you'd have like one fully vertically integrated manufacturer so this was already like an industry that was large but I think like the, the moment where like the sort of like modern Chinese watch industry like had like a big like boost was when the country started opening and a lot of like well uh, foreign brands started investing in the country to, to create like modern facilities uh, to buy like those like modern like CNC machines and, and, and whatnot so you have this like big like sort of like park of like uh, manufacturing capabilities which is a very large and b most importantly like new and advanced because yeah. it was built like in the 80s to, to 90s and, and the skill when it comes to watchmaking those ones like they as we're saying i think that they, they go back to the, the 50s but also then even like besides that like all some other skills which are used in watchmaking like you can like sort of like find them like much before in china like you know like well uh, so some metal working skills, yeah, some engraving, some enameling, space, engraving yeah. like all, all these things. Black like, spades, yeah, 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 of course. Because yeah. it was, it's always been a very autarchic kind of a society where they were able to master all the all the uh, production processes pretty, pretty much on, mm. the, on the industrial and artisanal level, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Last question on this, uh, for me, very interesting topic. You could have easily done a Swiss made brand, you know, still using the same supplies you're, yeah. you, you, you're using oh, now. Definitely. But you, yeah. you chose transparency and you chose actually, nobody does it. I'm going to be the one actually giving the, 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 the importance that these artisans deserve. Yeah, no, but the thing is that at the same time, this is the thing that is true to my co founder and myself. Like, we, I mean, at the onset, we, we are doing that because there is this mission to, to show this beauty of like the Chinese culture and the Chinese craftsmanship around the world. So this is what's driving us there. It's not like we, we didn't embark on this venture just to like create a company and, 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 and sell some watches that, that that's not really the point. The point is, is really like to show to people what Chinese culture and Chinese craftsmanship can be about. So that's why really like we, we, we need to and we want to, to stick to this core idea and core belief of ours, which is like to, to really like transparently, openly and, and proudly, most importantly, like do really everything in China. And I mean, I haven't 
yet talked about my consider, but he's he's also French, but he's born and raised in Hong Kong, lived there till he's like 16 or 17, uh, spent a lot of time in, in mainland China as well. And he's like also very attached and keen to the idea that like Chinese culture is wonderful, it's very rich. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's, it's a bit of a shame that not a lot of people know about it or yeah. can experience its beauty. So yeah. this all, for all us great, is a uh, great opportunity yeah. for you both. Yeah, 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 yeah like, absolutely. Uh, cool. so, Today, uh, Robin and I are both wearing yes. the Perception, uh, the, the new collection from Atelier Ven. You may have seen already, may have had the opportunity to see the pre-order uh, happening on the Atelier Ven website. Very soon we'll give that option in the UK as well. Uh, but to come to this very mature endeavor, I, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying wearing the, the Perception, uh, Robin. I'm really, really impressed with the level of details that you have put in and you have explained we're not going to have the time today to go through all these different details, uh, but surely, certainly, we can start from the basic fundamental point yeah. to transparently give your genuine message. You started from one of the true masters of uh, Chinese uh, artisanal craft. Master Chen yeah. has been a fundamental pivoting yeah, yeah, asset yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. De de definitely. So I, I guess really like the, the center point of this watch is its handmade uh, guilloche dial uh, by Master Chen Yutai, who is like China and also Asia only guilloche master craftsman. Um, for us, the reason why so we... So can you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, so, sorry. Chai, the only master yeah, engraver, yeah. The, the, yeah. Only ma the only guilloche master craftsman of like China and, and the Asia. The whole of China. Yeah, yeah and, and also Asia. I mean, we, we, we look like high and low for, for if there was another one maybe in Japan, but we, we couldn't find one. And like all our research is like tend to point out that he's really the only one on the continent to do to do guilloche. The, the reason why we worked with him was because, you know, again, like with our goal of really like celebrating the local culture and craftsmanship, I think for us, the only way to achieve that is to do real craftsmanship. So when we were designing that watch, of course, we were tempted to do, oh, wh why don't we do a stem dial or a CNC guilloche dial? But then we realized, oh, this is not really like who we are or who we want to be. Like to really be true to that purpose, it needs to be like handmade. And that's really how we'll show the, the craftsmanship. Um, yeah, and, 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 and to put things in perspective, it reminds me the example of Garrick, for example, that in the UK yeah. have taken years to get to that point, because also in the UK, that is an art and a craft that is not yeah. Easy, easy to find. Uh, in China or in Asia, even less. Yeah, so. even less. But mm -hmm. yeah, we, we found this like incredible like uh, craftsman that is like Chen Yutai, and he has a very interesting story in the sense that he come like from a very poor village in in the countryside in in Henan province, and he was quite bad at school, so he had to drop out very early on. He was sent on like by his family to earn money working in factories. Uh, very miserable living, if I have to say. But still, like he kind of like hanged on and he managed to like secure an apprenticeship, which took very long. And eventually, when he was in his 30s, he became a sort of like qualified machinist. But one day, one of his like childhood friends came to him, showed him an old Russian uh, cigar uh, box, which was guilloche, and it sort of like triggered something in him. Like he, he thought it was absolutely wonderful. He learned that no one is doing it in China, so sort of very brazenly, he decided he would be the first one to do it. But he had no idea Great how story. to do it. And, and you know, you, you don't find a, a rose engine like that. I mean, even mm. in Switzerland, A, they are not being made anymore, yeah. and B, like the, the pre-owned one, like you don't really find them yeah. this way. So imagine in China. Uh, and it's also someone who didn't know how to use the internet, so he couldn't really look online uh, how to, to make a rose engine. But still, he left everything. He went back to, to Henan province. Uh, he, he found like a workshop in a cave, because uh, before in China, they, they would put some like industrial facilities in caves so that they could be like uh, protected from attacks or, or whatnot. And for three years, he tried to build a rose engine and he failed and he failed again and again and again. But still, he didn't give up and eventually he had his own rose engine. And the thing, so he built, basically built his, yes, own, his own machine. But, yeah. yeah, and he didn't like, sort of like get direct inspiration from a Swiss one or a German one or whatnot, yeah. because he couldn't use internet. Like he, he didn't all came know. from his own. Yeah, yeah, and he got some patents for, for this one. Uh, yes. so, so it's, it's really incredible. And, and what really moved us was how crazy he was into the craft to like, really like stick to it you know yeah. like no reasonable person would have done that yeah. at some point you you look at the facts and the figures and you're like oh i, I don't know how to do that uh, i have a job i have a stable life why, why would i drop everything but still because he really loved it 
uh, almost in an unreasonable artistic way, he, he decided to, to venture on this path. Well and this is beautiful for yeah. us. This is like the, the true sign and the, the, the true mark of the artist. Yeah. Like, uh, the, the true this. sign of, of real genius in a way is when, you know, from a vision you get to the to the realization mm, of the project, mm, yeah. which is a completely different uh, thing altogether. Uh, so the central piece, definitely the work of Master Chen, but to be, how can I say, you've been humble enough to actually perpetuate the way of doing of Master Chen to the rest of the watch. Because when I have been talking to you, um, the amount of details that you, you have actually managed to incorporate in a, what we would class as a sport chic integrated yeah. bracelet uh, model, is actually mind blowing from you. the you know the the selection of the the movement the decoration of the case back but all of those details that come with the with the bracelet and that have to do with the comfort of wearing the watch itself do you want to briefly yeah. uh, let us know what was important for you to nail to go out to market loud and proud not just with Mr. Uh, master chen's work but also yeah, no, with uh, of course of course because i mean for, for us uh, a watch is a complete whole you know the people are not getting a dial they are, they are getting like a whole that embodies the concept so so for that reason we also wanted the watch of the rest of the watch sorry, to, to be like sort of equally great um so we use like 904l uh, stainless steel uh which when polished like is like shinier and winter than like regular 316l so, so so that for us was something quite quite nice um we we paid like really a lot of attention to like the the, the wearing experience of the watch the comfort and i guess one of the the key things uh we did in that regard is like the, the micro adjustment uh, feature where you can like simply like press that button on the clasp and you can extend the bracelet and press again to like retract it and uh, which on its own i can tell you because we deal with some pretty special uh, watch brands positioned very high even in a price level it's a nightmare for, it's been a nightmare for many of them to be able to actually uh, engineer and propose on their own collections as well so in itself already great detail for sure thank you thank you thank you the, the, the reason actually for that was uh, when I was uh, living in Hong Kong uh, you know the humidity is extremely high so it's really hard to wear like a bracelet watch so either it's too loose and it's uh, when you're inside, like it will just go up and down your wrist or it's like very tight and you know, you're outside, it's very humid, your wrist swollen and it, it's not comfortable. So, so actually, sure. yeah, that, that was the reason why we went this way. But to, to go back on the focus of, of the rest of the watch, there's like plenty of other stuff. Uh, we worked a lot on, on the case back. We went with this semi display design. Uh, here we have like a garden lion, um, which you usually find at the entrance of like temples because like uh, traditional architecture was the, the red thread of this watch. Um, we, we made it quite playful and when the rotor aligns like it looks like the, the lion is laughing so that was sort of like a, a nice like little easter egg for us yeah and through this like semi display case back you, you can see our movement so it's a customized movement made by the, the dandong watch factory in, in dandong it's called sl 1588 and what's really special about it is that it's extremely thin uh, we had 3.3 mm uh, which is like so, super thin is it, is it like an eta eta clone like no, very no, similar not really. to, to so actually it, it's based on their own architecture which is called SL1 but we had it modified in in a few ways uh, one which was that we managed to get it like slightly thinner B we increased the power reserve because it's very thin like usually the I mean initially the power reserve was limited but we moved it to like 41 hours and C we also increased uh, the accuracy so when it leaves the, the Dandong watch factory it's at plus minus 10 seconds per day but then we adjust it to five positions ourselves so it's like better than that yeah uh, very good we, we also good. like played the, the rotor in, in like a, a deep black which mm. i think like looks nice with like the overall like sporty team uh, that's been so. noticed as well as another additional detail so yeah absolutely great 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 fantastic so a great uh, a great piece that talks in so many different ways culturally technically from the engineering perspective so congratulations Thank you. robin Thanks a lot. Well. i think there's a great future in, in front of you and uh, in, in regards to that i would like to ask you uh what's in the pipeline for for the brand are you working on some other collections how do you see the brand developing you're working with a highly skilled uh, artisan yeah what is your realistic production capacity and are you moving also to on to some other projects as well yeah of course so uh f f first to talk about the artisans our big goal is to also like help him um develop i mean that goes back to the the core purpose of the brand um so we are we are actually investing in his workshop we are enabling him to to build like a new rose engine so that also he can sort of like bring up 
his apprentices like uh, up the, the sort of like competency chain and he can move from like being like a single craftsman to actually a workshop from Meteda dials uh, in, in, in China. So um, of course this takes time. Like it's, it's you so can't to like... Scale it, I know it's not a good word, but to scale it up in a, in, in a way that yeah, you, yeah, can, you can create I, I, new talent. I, I think sc scaling up is not necessarily the, the mm. right word because it sounds like too aggressive, but it's more like developing uh, his activity and his footprint. I think the closest analogy for us would be like Carrie Butilainen and Kumblemin. Yeah. Usually, I mean, initially, sorry, Carrie was doing everything by himself and then he managed to build this wonderful workshop where they make incredible uh, metal dials. So I think this is uh, what we'd like to build with, th with that goes Chinese through the ed education of disciples and you know students yeah, and make them in. And you don't do it overnight because it's such like a delicate craft, it's such like a um, skill intensive crafts so yeah. that, that that takes a long time and we're happy to spend this time and, and, and to wait and to but but yeah but we want to do it we want to accompany Master Cheng to to enable him to, to build that and also sort of like build something that will last in China you know not just be an, an oddity but actually like build a generation of, of craftsmen over there so that's that's yeah one big goal of ours uh, in regards to like new products um, again we want to get like gradually closer to that vision of ours of, of really having the very best handcrafted Chinese watches. Uh, so for the next series, I mean, I, I can't say too much just yet, but we're working on one with a, a fully handmade movement by a very interesting Chinese watchmakers. Um, it, it's obviously very challenging to do, uh, but we, we hope we can maybe release that next year. Um, and we're working on a bunch of other stuff, but yeah, I, I guess we will see soon enough. Fantastic, fantastic. You, uh, Robin, you really strike me for the way you have embraced also culturally the challenge that you have uh, in your hands. And it really looks like you're having a lot of fun in yeah. developing it. Like, you know, we are we are the limited edition as well, discovering these new stories that are out there, but they're just not being exposed. And that's what we like the most uh, doing. So um, personal question, do you, are you so, and you know, entwined with the Chinese culture that you speak the language as well? Um, I, 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 I don't speak it so well, but my, my, my partner like speaks it like fluently, like oh, yeah. very, very well. Yeah. He speaks it so well that um, every year you have like a, a competition for foreigners that speak Chinese in China. And uh, one year he took part in it and he was one of like the, the finalists. Uh, oh, when Chinese people call him on the phone, they can't believe he's like not Chinese. Uh, amazing. So, so, it's, yeah. so it's, it's really yeah, a genuine story that, uh, yeah, that is, uh, yeah. it's amazing to be exposed to. Uh, one thing we have forgotten, soon the perception will be available on the limited edition platform. The retail price for the UK is £2,260, excluding VAT. Robin has been so kind to actually uh, let us have some, some stock available, which, yeah. is, which is amazing. And so we will be able soon to announce the collaboration and to make some pieces available for all of those that want to, uh, uh, to discover a, a whole new way of, uh, of um, proposing affordable and yet artisanal, highly skilled uh, watchmaking. Uh, Robin, it's been a pleasure to have wow. you with us. L likewise, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. It was also a big pleasure, so yeah. Thank, thank you. you, and uh, you'll have to teach me how you say thank you very much uh, and see you all soon in Chinese. <laughs> yeah, you can just say like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you.